Welcome back to the channel. Mark Zuckerberg admits in a letter to Congress that the Biden administration pressured Facebook to remove posts about COVID-19, including satirical posts, and that in retrospect, he regrets that he caved to government pressure. This is an important and perhaps even the most important news story, but nobody wants to cover it in the lay media. And that's, I think, one of the biggest problems. So let me read you verbatim what Mark Zuckerberg wrote in his letter to Congress. This is his own words. In 2021, senior officials from the Biden administration, including the White House, repeatedly pressured our teams for months to censor certain COVID-19 content, including humor and satire, and expressed a lot of frustration with our teams when we didn't agree. Ultimately, it was our decision whether or not to take down content, and we make our own decisions, including COVID-19 related changes we made to our enforcement in the wake of this pressure. I believe the government pressure was wrong, and I regret we were not more outspoken about it. I also think we made some choices that, with the benefit of hindsight and new information, we wouldn't make today. Like I said to our teams at the time, I feel strongly that we should not compromise our content standard due to pressure from any administration in either direction, and we're ready to push back if something like this happens again. Wow. The Biden administration pressured Facebook, a private company, to censor speech that was even humor and satire about the COVID-19 vaccine. Let me, let me get into this. Let's get into this. This, I think, is an important news story about one of the most dangerous threats I write in my blog post on Vinay Prasad's observations and thoughts on Substack. One of the most dangerous threats today, which is the government believing it's doing the right thing by a handful of people who don't know that much pressuring and censoring the speech of Americans, including scientists who disagree. And I think that's an incredibly dangerous precedent that's being set by this administration. So back in 2021, the Biden administration had inherited a COVID-19 vaccine from the prior administration from Donald Trump. Donald Trump, through Operation Warp Speed, accelerated the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. I don't think anyone denies that. This administration inherited that vaccine. They were in charge of the rollout and in many ways, I think they bungled it horrifically. They prioritized frontline responders and teachers who didn't have that higher risk of dying of COVID-19. They didn't prioritize older people who had a 1,000-fold higher risk or 10,000-fold higher risk of dying of COVID-19. They prioritized people who had a maybe one to two-fold higher risk, which is a big mistake. They didn't split the doses. They didn't do a one-dose-first strategy. There were many things that were being proposed that not only they didn't do, they didn't run a single study to test whether or not it might be better. And they went on TV, folks like Anthony Fauci, and said, we know for sure we shouldn't do that. Of course, Fauci was famously wrong yet again. Then by June of 2021, July 2021, they had seen the Provincetown, Massachusetts outbreak of COVID-19, which was an outbreak predominantly in people who had already been vaccinated from COVID-19. The administration knew by the summer of 2021 that whether or not you get a vaccine, you cannot halt transmission. Those people will still be able to transmit. And yet it was not until the third and fourth quarter of 2021 that they pushed forth with their vaccine mandate, firing federal employees, military soldiers, other people who, and then they pressured, you know, through OSHA, other groups of people, firing people who didn't get a vaccine. There was no exemption made for natural immunity. That was another Biden administration decision that was boneheaded. There was no allotment or consideration for the fact that why would you mandate a vaccine if it can't halt transmission? You don't even prima facie have a case for mandate. Even if it could halt transmission, I think there are lots of reasons why you wouldn't want to mandate it. But if it can't halt transmission, if it can't benefit third parties, even at the outset, you can't even consider mandate. That was another decision they made. Vaccine safety was percolating throughout 2021. Early in 2021, we learned about vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, or VIT, from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and also AstraZeneca globally. We also learned about myocarditis in February from the Israelis after mRNA vaccines. The same administration, particularly Rochelle Walensky, delayed and obfuscated the safety signal and never acted upon the safety signal. She didn't take vaccine safety seriously. She denied it when she was first asked about myocarditis in a Reuters article. You can go find that. I've tweeted the link many times. You can find it in my article on COVID-19 vaccines, a history that appears in the Monash Bioethics Review. So here you have an administration that's bungling the rollout, that's bungling the mandate, that's ignoring safety signals. In other words, they are screwing up left, right, and center. And 
they don't want other people to criticize them. That to me is so dangerous. They're pressuring Facebook to remove posts about myocarditis, posts about um, vaccine safety, even satirical posts about what vaccines might do. I recall distinctly that they even removed posts where people said true things. My friend got a vaccine and then X, Y, Z happened to him. Now you can say, well, X, Y, and Z happening to him, that's not because he got the vaccine. Sure, but that post did not say it was because. They just said this happened and that happened. They removed that. You can't deny that it happened after the fact. I mean, we can all agree that it may not be causally linked, but we can't deny that it occurred. They removed those posts, true posts about what people experienced, anecdotal reports they removed. This is incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous because the administration was wrong in all these fronts. And why were they wrong? I think we don't talk enough about that. I think the people they are hired to put in these roles are political lapdogs. They're people who have been known to be loyal to Democrats for many years. Mandy Cohen was once part of Doctors for Obama, um, you know, Rochelle Walensky. Uh, you know, many of these people are known to be loyal to Democrats. Ashish Jha was on TV every day um, kissing up constantly to the Biden administration. They're picking people who are loyalists. Vivek Murthy, again, doctors for Obama, that's where he goes back to. Nobody thinks Vivek Murthy is actually the best doctor. In fact, he probably won't even crack the top 50th percentile, but he has that role because he used to work for doctors for Obama. You pick these people who just aren't good. I mean, they're not good in the sense that they're not the best people. It's not a meritocracy. They're loyal people. They don't have training in evidence-based medicine. They don't have training in the history of medicine, medicine fiascos. They don't have formal training, I think, in medical ethics. Even if they had that training, they might not be great either, but they certainly don't have that training. And they don't have a body of scholarship that would suggest they know those principles or facts. You pick these people, you put them in this role, and they just want to do things. They like that old saying in medicine, don't just stand there, do something. But the problem is they make mistakes along the way. They're doing things confidently. They have this idea that if we express to the public any uncertainty about what we're doing, that's a chink in our armor. We're gonna show them a vulnerability and they're gonna attack us. So they lie and obfuscate and pretend there's no uncertainty. And even that I'm willing to accept that they're incompetent and bungling it, perhaps in some cases even worse than incompetent, malicious because they're arranging in sort of weird financial relationships where they're consulting for the companies are going to go to consult for the companies later. So in some cases, maybe even worse than just incompetence. But even that I'm willing to accept. But then they go the extra step where they censor the speech of people who disagree with them. They pressure the company with the force of the government, which I believe is in clear violation of the First Amendment, to, to remove speech that will draw attention to the fact that they are wrong. That is so dangerous. They dethrottled Jay Bhattacharya, uh, who is a Stanford professor who has been more right than many people, than probably most people in the pandemic, on um, school closure, on masking, on vaccine policy. He's been very right. They censored him because they could not afford to let the public decide who was right. He's a card-carrying professor. In many ways, his credentials are superior to the people in the administration, but they didn't, you know, by traditional scientific metrics for what that's worth, but they didn't engage in a fair fight. So back to Zuckerberg's. I think it's incredibly important. And some people have said that we should criticize Zuckerberg, et cetera. We gotta give him credit for coming out now. He's coming out and perhaps with some encouragement, he might come out further and more strongly and actually give us the names of all the people. I suspect from other litigation, Morthy versus Missouri, the Supreme Court case, it's gonna be people like Andy Slavitt, like Vivek Morthy, people who uh, think that they were right and then they feel that sort of moral, um, confidence that they're right, even though they were bungling left, right, and center and grossly incompetent at the job. Zuckerberg might give us the names. He might give us some of the specific communication that was said. It might strengthen a, a, a subsequent Supreme Court case. I think Morthy versus Missouri is not completely done at the Supreme Court. So I think it's, incur it's important to encourage him. I think he is doing the right thing. I think he was probably put in a difficult situation and one thing that Facebook could do in the future is actually have their own inside panel of experts who have a range of views. This is one thing that all these people could do is that when you have a team of people on any health policy issue, have at least three or four people who strongly disagree with the others and let's hear what they have to say because they are often able to be more persuasive. Now, everyone on this channel knows, I think universities failed greatly. I'm of course, a professor of epidemiology, at a good university, universities fail greatly because we did not host debates on these topics. 
it's still taboo to this day to have a conference at a university. Stanford's having a conference soon in October, October 4th. If you're in the Bay Area, you should come. I think I'll be speaking on one of the panels. It's hosted by Jay Bhattacharya. We're having a conference about pandemic policy. It's still taboo in most places to have that conference. We do not have debates at my university about the winter mask mandate, which is coming again, about whether or not we should be recommending or mandating the fall booster. We don't have debates. There's just this big bureaucracy that's doing whatever the Biden administration tells them, and it's all incompetently run. And it's not in the spirit of universities where if there is uncertainty, if there's some faculty, and there are, several, there are many faculty who are either not complying with it and being vocal about not complying with it, you should have a town hall, a forum, let people have an Oxford-style debate. They don't want to do it. Universities are abdicating their role as a forum for dialogue to podcasts. And then they're upset that everyone's listening to Joe Rogan and nobody gives a shit about the university. Well, what do you want when you're not actually giving people the content that they want? Instead, they're only letting the most boring lecturers who never said anything interesting in their lives do all the content. And of course, nobody goes to class anymore. You know, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy when you don't have engaging content because you're scared. That it, and what are they scared of? They're scared that a tiny fraction of people who are broken in our society, they, not, they view disagreement and debate as a threat, as platforming or whatever, these kind of foolish words they use. They, ha they suffer from an, uh, a philosophy that's so degraded that they are unwilling to subject even the most basic ideas they have to a dialogue or debate, probably because those ideas would not survive. Back to Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg has come out and he said that the Biden administration pressured Facebook to remove these posts. Marion Gruber and Phil Krause, who are director and, F and deputy director at the FDA, have come out and said that under the Biden administration, they were pressured to approve COVID boosters for everyone and that they were demoted from work at, by, by Peter Marks so that he could expedite the approval of these processes. They were demoted, it turns out, in congressional testimony from Phil Krause, because the Biden administration wanted to rush a full FDA approval of COVID-19 vaccines so that they could mandate it. The Biden administration decided way up high by a bunch of incompetent people that they wanted to mandate the vaccine. They pushed Facebook to silence dissent, and they pushed FDA to make it a full approval so that they could have the legal authority, or at least they thought, to do so. That is so dangerous. It's so, they happen to be wrong. Even if they were right, it would be dangerous, but they happen to be completely wrong. It's the absolute most dangerous thing if government can silence dissent and force you to get medical products that actually don't benefit third parties. I think there might be some people out there who think that the vaccine mandate had some good, like there's somebody out there who wouldn't have gotten vaccinated. He got vaccinated and he lowered his risk of severe disease and death. Somebody might think that. I think you have to weigh that against, even if you thought that, which I think is dubious by third and fourth quarter 2021, but even if you thought that, one thing I would say, consider the age of the person you're mandating. They, the mandates typically punish the, the youngest people the most because they're still in the labor force, not these 85-year-old people. You're not really forcing the person who probably could have benefited the most. You're forcing somebody who might not benefit at all. Two, there's no carve out for prior natural immunity, so it's kind of a pretty stupid policy. Three, what about all the harm to the people who quit their job rather than comply, that's a harm. And if they have depressed earnings and wages and depressed health outcomes in the future, you own those bad outcomes because you pushed them out of the labor force. And what about the harm of you've poisoned trust in vaccines and public vaccination campaigns and now vaccination rates are plummeting? That's harm you own too. So even if you had this deluded belief that we benefit some people, you have to think about all those harms and any rational calculus would suggest those harms outweigh your benefit tenfold. But I suspect you don't even have the benefits you think you have. It was completely misguided. I wrote many op-eds in 2021 telling them not to do it. They don't listen because they only listen to political lackeys and not people who have a heterodox point of view and, and call balls and strikes as they see them. And that's their biggest mistake. So the party of science is so scientific that they make scientific error after error and they don't have the guts to let critics oppose them in public forums. They illegally and unconstitutionally pressure the company to censor speech. The last point I make, it is literally the most anti-American thing, the most anti-American thing to believe that you are so right in your idiotic public health policy that you can remove humor and satire. You're, the stick is so far up your ass, you're removing satirical posts on Facebook. That is the most anti-American thing I could think of. 
in America, no matter who has ever been in charge, we've always agreed you can make as much fun of their stupidity as you want. That's everyone's God-given right. That's a constitutional right. And this government did not do so. And that, to me, is the single most anti-American thing you can do. The ability for government to quiet people who disagree with their policies is horrific. In this case, they happened to be repeatedly wrong. I encourage Mark Zuckerberg to come further out and criticize that. I think he's good to do that. Let's applaud him for doing that. And the more he tells us, I think we will find that it's going to be very bad for these people. People have always asked me, you know, you keep talking about this issue. Why? Well, I don't want to all the time because I'm going to do some other stuff. But, and I still do other stuff. I've got so many things going on. I don't have time to just talk about this. But the pendulum will swing on this issue. We were in extreme delusion. I remember a point when I wrote an article in the Atlantic magazine that said we shouldn't be masking little kids because that was stupid which it was, with a cloth mask. And everyone was mad at me. So many people were mad at me. Some people said, I'm going to cancel my subscription to the Atlantic. Oh, good. Oh, you know, what do I care about your subscription? To okay, fine. They were so mad at me. Of course, that pendulum has swung already. That's swinging. Nobody, nobody thinks masking kids was a good idea, ex except for the most, you know, I'll choose my words carefully, fearful people still left in society. Okay. Nobody thinks that. Lockdown, that pendulum has swung. School closure, that pendulum has swung. The pendulum is going to swing on all of this so badly. And when people like Mark come out and tell the full story of what this administration was doing, I think it's going to really swing. And COVID-19 is going to look really clear. It's going to look like, you know, there was a president in charge who made a lot of mistakes, got some things right, Operation Warp Speed, was, you know, given a lot of advice by really bad advisors like Fauci. And then a new person came into office saying, I'm going to do it right. That was the Biden administration's mandate. They ran on a platform of keeping school, schools closed. And then they proceeded to keep schools closed for another six months. And they did so many idiotic things along the way. But they were the party that said, we listen to scientists. We care about science. While they're silencing scientists, silencing satire, and doing idiotic decisions. And I think they're going to look very, very bad in the future because they had the opportunity, they had more data, they had a vaccine, and they could have restrained themselves from doing really boneheaded decisions. I also think there's a lot of th things we got wrong in 2020, so I'm happy to unpack that. But you can read it all in my essay on COVID-19 vaccines in the Monash Bioethics Review. All right, so if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. I'll be back with more videos. Um, this was by request. Also, follow me on Instagram. I'm now on Instagram at Vinay Prasad MD MPH and follow Vinay Prasad's observations and thoughts on Substack and become a subscriber because your subscriptions keep that Substack going and come to that October 4th conference at Stanford. So until next time.